Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, QuickBooks Online for Existing Nonprofit Users with Greg Bosson. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping item, items. So all callers will be muted. So if you have questions, there is a chat box that you should see on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along. We have several people on the back end who will be helping to answer those questions in addition to the Q&A at the end, which we'll try and get um, to all of our questions, all of your questions, as many as we can. If you're interested in seeing some of our past webinars, you can find them um, on the TechSoup website at techsoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. We'll also be sending an email with the presentation, the recording, and any relevant links once the webinar is over. And if you're on social media, feel free to give us a follow at TechSoup um, and use hashtag TSWebinars. However, we will be monitoring this uh, Q&A pretty closely. Also, if you have any trouble with your audio, I recommend just refreshing your browser um, and then logging in again with the link that was emailed to you. So just a little bit about TechSoup. So we are in 236 countries and territories. Um, we, we partner with several uh, technology companies such as Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft, Symantec, um, and as today, QuickBooks Made Easy. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot more information if you're interested about the no donation program on TechSoup.org slash Intuit. Also, if you're interested in learning more about uh, the QuickBooks, uh, QuickBooks Online Made Easy for Nonprofits, um, and then also QuickBooks Made Easy for Nonprofits, The Essentials, you can find that um, at TechSoup.org slash QuickBooks dash Made Easy. And you'll know more today. Uh, Greg will go into greater detail about what that is. Um, so just before we get started, I wanted to um, introduce Greg Bosson. So Greg Bosson is a practicing CPA and advanced certified QuickBooks Pro Advisor with a full service accounting firm located in Atlanta, Georgia. He's also the founder and CEO of QuickBooks Made Easy. And since 2000, Greg has been teaching live QuickBooks seminars around the country specifically designed for nonprofits. Um, he's considered to be a national expert in the program, which you'll see shortly. Um, and just a little bit about myself, I am the online learning producer here at TechSoup. And then on the back end answering chat, we have Lashika and Allison, and then we actually have um, a guest uh, assistant today, Susan, who's helping us with chat. And then David Webb from QuickBooks Made Easy, and then Megan from Mobius Group. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Greg. Thank you very much, Seema. And uh, you are about to uh, experience a webinar that's very different from most webinars. Me and you are going to be talking through the chat and stuff. So I'm going to be calling out names. And it's not one of those things where you can just kind of half listen or whatever. Uh, I'm going to call you out by name. So <laughs> for instance, uh, let's see, Devi. I love that name, Devi. Uh, say hello, Devi. T chat me up. I want to make sure. Yeah, that's right, Lori. You have to pay attention. Devi, where is Devi? See, this way we can find out if people are actually like not listening. Devi. I didn't say Devi, although thank you, Devi. I appreciate it. Devi. See, ah, there she is. What took you so long? I want to know what's going on, Devi. What are you doing in that life of yours that you signed up for a webinar? And then you're not listening. I don't understand. Anyway, so I want every single one of you to say hello uh, because I want to make sure that you can hear me. And I also want to you to tell me, am I too loud, too soft, or just perfect? Tell me what you think. I want to know, am I too loud or too soft? Because, ah, thank you. Becky says I'm just perfect. Spot on. All right. Looks like everybody is cool. All right. So, uh, Awesome. This is so exciting. By the, name, uh, by the way, my name uh, has two G's on the end because my mom didn't like the name Gregory, so she stuck an extra G on the end. So, um, so as Seema was explaining, and now I'm, now I'm going to be looking at the slide here for a second, I'm an advanced um, QuickBooks Pro Advisor, which means I've done a lot of work and done some testing and all this kind of stuff uh, to make me an advanced QuickBooks uh, Pro Advisor. Uh, but also, uh, I own my own accounting firm, uh, Greg S. Boston CPA PC. Yes, I'm in the middle of tax season, uh, and, but I specialize in my practice working with nonprofits. And so we have hundreds of nonprofits that we work with across the country in one way or the other. And so that's kind of one part of my personal life. And then the other thing is, we, uh, I have the company QuickBooks Made Easy. And QuickBooks Made Easy is all about 
teaching people in specific industries how to set up inner transactions so that they can get the reports that they need. And the industry that I'm mainly focused on in QuickBooks Made Easy Land is the same thing that I'm focused on in my accounting practice, which is nonprofits. Okay? So in QuickBooks Made Easy, we're all about teaching nonprofits uh, how to use QuickBooks. And we do this in a number of different ways here, actually three main ways. Uh, we have training products uh, because let me just tell you, it takes probably 16 hours of learning to get everything that you need to know how to set up inner transactions and get the reports you need if you're a nonprofit. I'm sure you've probably figured that out if you started trying to do this stuff and you're like, wow, there's a lot more here than I knew there was. Uh, so we have these training products. We're going to give you a pretty big discount. So if you like this, you're going to want to get the training product because you're going to get a big fat discount because you went to this webinar. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. We also have tech support. Some of you are like, gosh, I just wish I could talk to Greg. Well, you can. Uh, you can uh, talk to me for a year with a flat rate for a tech support agreement, and we're going to give you a discount on that. Uh, and then we also do live seminars and webinars. So those are kind of the three things that we do. We have products, tech support, and then live seminars and webinars. So that's kind of what we do here. Uh, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. There we go. Uh, so I told you we're going to give you discounts, and these are going to be the discount codes. Uh, we actually have a three-day webinar series just for online users, the only thing like it in the country. It's two hours a day for three days, and it's going to go over a lot more than we do here. Uh, it's uh, normally 200. We're giving it to you for 149. But we'll talk about that later. We also have discounts on these other things. I'm just going to move on here because you didn't come to listen to an advertisement, did you? Uh, this is where you can actually get stuff from QuickBooks. Um, and we'll talk about that again at the end. Let's just get into this. Uh, actually, yeah, no, all right. So here's what the agenda is. So um, first thing that I need to explain to you is this uh, webinar is for existing users. So we assume that you have a pretty basic understanding of the correct way to set up things in QuickBooks Online so that you can get the reports that you need. Now many of you will say, oh, that was already done, so I don't need to worry about it. But in my experience, a lot of you that are listening to me right now actually have things set up incorrectly, and that's why you're not getting the reports you need. So we did a whole webinar on this. Uh, I think it was last week or the week before. And um, I highly encourage you to watch that webinar if you haven't already. But real quickly, we are going to go through the best practices for list setup um, just to kind of go over it. It's going to take about three minutes. Uh, and then we're going to get into the details. Now, that was kind of a basic webinar that I did where we went into the setup. Consider this kind of an intermediate webinar. We're going to look at how to enter income and uh, uh, what was it, Elmore? I think it was Elmore was already asking uh, specifics about how to enter product sales and stuff like that. Uh, uh, Elmore wants a definition of a list. I'll do it in a moment, Elmore. Uh, so uh, anyway, we're going to look at how to enter income, then we're going to look at how to enter expenses, and it's all going to be a, just about nonprofit transactions, which is kind of cool. We'll take a look at reports for the board kind of while we're doing that other stuff. We're basically, we're going to do kind of like intermediate stuff in these three topics here. And then I have a whole bunch of advanced topics that are in the training, uh, the training products, and we teach it in our webinars too. But I've just picked a couple of them, restricted grants and inputting in-kind gifts. And we're going to kind of give you a basic overview of those two things. It's a lot of people want that stuff. So that's how we're going to run. Uh, but before we go any further, uh, I have a poll. So I want to see who went to the webinar and See, Mac, I don't remember when it was. What day was that? It wasn't last week. It was the day, the week before, I think. But I want everybody um, to was, answer to yeah. see. We had one on the 6th and then also on the 8th. Okay. Well, the one for the online edition people is the one I'm interested yeah. in. Yeah, the 8th. That was on the 8th. On the 8th. So I really want to make sure that you do that. So we've got 359 participants, and we've gotten around 225 poll results, which means I'm waiting for other people that aren't listening. That's so upsetting to me. Anyway, uh, so all right, I'm going to go ahead. It looks like you all are answering, but it looks like more than half of you did not go to 
that webinar last week. About 100 of you did, but the rest of you didn't. Uh, and so that's concerning to me. Uh, and I want you to watch that webinar. But we'll go over it like in two minutes, everything that we did in an hour and a half. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results here so you can see where you sit. So about two-thirds of the people, it's the first webinar that they've ever been to that I've taught. So um, we're going to go through basics in a couple of minutes about how to set, it, set things up, and we'll tell Elmore what a list is. Uh, and then, uh, and then the rest of these people, that's kind of cool, 105 people still want to listen to me and you, David. That's pretty cool. Unless David, David, are you there? I'm here. David's kind of, all right, David's I'm, like my cohort in crime. Uh, we travel together to do the live seminars, and we get into a lot of trouble. But anyway, so uh, this is – next slide. Uh, I, just as a real general slide that uh, TechSoup likes me to explain to people, just so you understand that QuickBooks is a financial software package. Okay? It will do your financial statements. It will track your receivables and payables. It will also do payroll and credit card processing, but you have to pay into it extra money for that. So you may not be using those options. Um, but anyway, uh, and then also, and we're going to be talking about this, you can use the online edition as a light donor uh, database, which means you can get donor reports, you can get year and donor letters, you can get kind of a donor receipt, you can even get a donor thank you. It's a little difficult to get, but you can do it. Uh, so a lot of you that don't have another donor database, uh, you can use QuickBooks as a donor database, and we'll talk more about that when we get into how to enter income. All right. So, uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to cover, because I just think it's important to go ahead and see this. Now, I want everybody to answer this poll. How? Uh, what? What type of software – you have the online edition, hopefully. Uh, which edition do you have? Do you have Plus, Essentials, Simple Start, Self-Employed, Desktop, or I don't own? Now, if you don't know what you have, just don't answer. Okay? If you don't know which one you have, don't answer. Now, the one that you can get from TechSoup, which is only $50 a year, as opposed to Intuit, which is like $30, $40, or $50 a month, uh, the one you can get from TechSoup uh, is Plus. And that's actually the best one of all. It's the only one that allows you to do budgeting, and the only one that allows you to track your programs. So that's the one that you need. So the people that have Simple Start, or Self-Employed, or The Essentials, you need to get Plus. Um, and it looks like we've got 30 people that don't own uh, that are on the desktop. So you are actually in the wrong webinar. Uh, now we are going to we did a desktop webinar like this, uh, but if you you're already here, and I'm extremely interesting, and the techniques that you use to enter transactions are the same regardless of whether you're in the desktop or not. So I say hang out. Uh, we're going to get wild and woolly here. Plus we're giving away. I think, David, aren't we giving away a car at the end of this thing? This is close. We're not giving away the car. <laughs> we are not giving away. Okay, I thought we were giving away a car. All right. All right, so let's go on. Oh, let me show you where you, uh, where you are in the – and there we go. So there's a lot of people that are in the wrong webinar. But hang out. Uh, don't worry. You're cool. Uh, and we still got 100 people that didn't respond. Maybe they don't know what they have, so that's cool. So uh, first thing that I want to explain to you uh, with this is that you really have to have the Plus version again, because the Plus version is the one that, tell, that allows you to have budgeting. And now if you don't know what you have, let me just share my screen real quick. So right now you should be seeing uh, the actual uh, QuickBooks Online. Is that what you're seeing, David? Do you see that QuickBooks what Online? Seeing. Okay, cool. Correct. So if, you, if, if, first of all, if your screen doesn't look like this, if your screen looks like this when you're in QuickBooks, you in the wrong webinar. Okay, this, this is the desktop version. But again, hang out. Believe me, you're going to learn. We're not teaching this today, uh, but the techniques are, saying, are the same. We're teaching this. This is the online edition. So the online edition, uh, if you want to see whether or not you have the plus version, you go to this gear, okay, over here to the gear, and you click on uh, account and settings. And that's basically the same thing as your preferences if you were in the desktop. So I'll click it. And then all these different categories over here on the left-hand side, and you look for billing and subscription. 
and you click on that, and then it's going to tell you when you get to billing and subscription if it'll open. There we go. It'll tell you what you have, and as you can see, I've got plus. All right. So that's what the deal is with that. So uh, does anybody have any questions before we get into the income piece? Uh, and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time in QuickBooks, but I just have one more slide to show you. Anyone have any questions I need to ask or answer? David? Um, well, someone wanted to know if you're going to be covering uh, importing data from other sources like banks, credit cards, revenue collected. We are going to talk about how to download transactions for a couple of minutes. Um, so we are going to cover that, uh, and so that will be covered. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <clears throat> and uh, oh yeah, so transferring to Plus, so you can upgrade fairly easily. Um, there's usually an upgrade button. Uh, if you don't have Plus, there's usually an upgrade button right here actually. But, um, and the other thing I will go ahead and cover, and I know a number of you are asking this, if you already have uh, the online edition and you have it from uh, from uh, other than, than TechSoup. If you bought it online from Intuit, you're paying $20 or $30 or $40 a month. Whereas if you had it from uh, TechSoup, it's only $50 a year. The issue with that uh, is that if you want to change it so that you're only paying $50 a year, you actually have to open up a new account through uh, the one that you get from TechSoup, and then you have to take your account that you have and you have to move it over to the, the TechSoup uh, 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 QuickBooks Online account. And that's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we have found a uh, – because what happens is you, you basically, when you're in QuickBooks, uh, you have to basically export the data and then import it back into the new file. And that becomes a little challenging, and I don't want to get into this too much but uh, there is a company called, and I, I will go ahead and tell you guys this. What is it? Is it Chrono Books? Uh, Megan yeah, Chrono can, Books. Yeah, yeah, Megan can chat about it, and it allows you to basically seamlessly move a data file from one online account to another. So um, uh, that's kind of where I want to. Uh, yeah, Amanda wants to know, can you manage a database of clients or donors in QB Online? And you can, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So let's move on. So what I'm going to do, well, unless, is there something else pressing? Because I want to get into the income stuff. Nope, that's it. Okay, let's move. So um, when it comes, oh, before I even get into the income, there's one other thing I forgot to tell you. Let me go to this first slide. So remember I told you I wanted to give you, so every single person needs to listen to me right now. This is kind of a summary of what we covered in the hour and a half a webinar that we did, I think it was on the 8th. And this is what I'm assuming you already know. So if you don't know this or you don't have it set up, you need to watch that webinar. But anyway, not to leave you in the dust here. So when it comes to your programs, you want to use the class feature in QuickBooks for that. Okay? And because as a nonprofit, you have to categorize your expenses into either program, admin, or fundraising. Some people call that the function. And so that's what we generally use classes for. That way we can see how much our admin costs are, our fundraising costs, and our program costs. But there's a second thing you also got to say the object of the, uh, of the transaction, which is basically the natural category of the transaction. And the natural category would be something like salaries, travel, supplies, um, rent. This is the normal way people think about expenses. And every time you enter a transaction, you got to say what the natural category is, as well as whether it's a program, admin, or fundraising class. So uh, uh, that, these two lists, that's what they're for. And, and Elmore, it's kind of hard to describe. A list is basically QuickBooks has all these lists, and that's where you put not transactions, but it puts, it, it, you put everything related to a transaction, like there's a list for your accounts. There's a list for your, class, your uh, programs, admin, or fundraising. That's the class list. There's a list where your customers go, and there's a list where your vendors go. So, um, and so this is with the appropriate setup. And I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I'm going to go ahead and just stay in the online edition for the rest of the seminar because there's no sense 
who wants a PowerPoint presentation? But anyway, so um, the, it's very important that you set your lists up correctly. Now to get to your lists, you have to go to this little gear right here. And probably the easiest thing to do is to go to All Lists right there. And it will give you, Elmore, all of your lists. Okay? And I'm going to click on Classes. And as you can tell, this is where I have one for each of my programs. I have three programs in this organization. We have a Guidance Center, a Conference, an Aware Campaign, and then we have Admin and Fundraising. So every single person should have at least three classes. One for admin, one for fundraising, and one for your program. We happen to have three programs, and so we have three, cl three more classes for a total of five. Okay? So then I'm going to go to the gear, and I'm going to click on All Lists again. And then here's your chart of accounts. And your chart of accounts is probably the most important list of all because it determines what your financial statements are. Okay? And this is where you would put your natural categories, salaries, payroll taxes, health insurance, stuff that pretty much everybody has. These are generic. They're not related to any one program. You may have equipment rental in all three programs, okay? it's just, but you only need one equipment rental expense account. So by having these two lists, which are really important, when you go to enter a transaction, which we'll get into, to in a little bit, but um, just ahead of time, you can point it not only to an expense account, dues and subscriptions, but over here you can tell it whether it's program, admin, or fundraising. And in case you're wondering, some expenses need to be split, and you can certainly take an individual expense and point one of it to one and one of it to another. So the advantage of that is that I'm just going to go ahead and skip. We have a little section on reports, but I'm going to skip to a report right now. QuickBooks has a report called a P&L by class. And what it does is it gives you your P&L, but each – so the rows are the natural categories or your chart of accounts list, and the columns are your classes. So you can see very easily – not only what you're spending on each program, admin and fundraising, but if you put the revenue related to a program to that program, then you can also see whether you're making or losing money. So that's the appropriate setup. Um, classes are for your programs. Chart of accounts are for your natural categories. And your grants and your donors, they go in the customer list. And I'm going to show you where that is. It's very weird. The customer list is hidden in QuickBooks. It's so strange. Um, the customer list is within this sales button, which is so stupid. But anyway, I click it. And it's, customers are related to sales. So you'll go over here and this says customers. Yours may say donors. It's the same thing. As a matter of fact, you have the ability to change this name. I'll show you where to do it in a minute. But I'll go over here to customers. And then Elmore, this is where you put all of your donors. You'll see that we also put our restricted grants here as well. And then finally, your vendors, uh, they'll go under the – and you go to the expenses, and you go under the vendors tab, and here's where your vendors are. Okay? So those are the four main lists. And we covered those in a lot more detail in the hour and a half webinar, but again, I'm assuming that you already know that. Now, going back to the customer list, if you want to know how to change the name from customers to donors or members or something like that, you go over to the preferences. So you've got to go to the gear. You go to Account and Settings. And then we're going to go over to Advanced. And then we're going to scroll down to the bottom, and you'll see something that says Customer Label right there. See how this says Customers? If I click this, I can change the name. So I'll change mine to Donors, and then I'll click Save. And so now – let me get out of here. Now when I go over to Sales, this says Donors. All right? No big deal. Now if you're thinking to yourself, well, I want two lists, one for donors and one for members. Not happening. Everybody that gives you money needs to be in the same list. Very sorry about that. It's called the customer list, or if you want to change the name, you can. So that's it for the setup piece. Um, I'm going to get into income, but let me just ask, does anybody have any questions about income, about setting up? Did I confuse people? What are you thinking? David? 
Um, I have uh, Julie that says, uh, how do you deal with her, both customers and vendors? With the same so, so what, yeah, what Julie's talking about is, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, sometimes you have a donor that also does work for you. So they're a donor and they, pay, they give you money, but they're also a vendor because you pay them. And QuickBooks can't use the same name on more than one list. So what you have to do is you have to basically you have to change the name. You have to put a dash V or for vendor or something like that. Maybe put a little, little initial so that you can use it. That's just the, the way that it goes. Sorry about that, Julie. Um, next question. Robin wanted to know, are 1099 contractors vendors or employees? Oh, great question. They're vendors. They cannot be employees. They're vendors. And as a matter of fact, hold on a second here. Workers. I think I think that's just your uh, – let me see whether – oh, no. Okay, they just changed this. How annoying. So this says workers, and your 1099s go right here in the contractor list. They changed that about a month ago. So, um, oh, you know what, though? These are still in the vendor list. So what you do to set up your 1099s, you go in the vendor list, and then you click New Vendor, and you fill it out. Um, and uh, uh, let's see here. Track payments for 1099, and you check that box right there, and then that makes them a 1099 person. All right. Uh, anybody else got a question? Uh, yeah, there's quite a few actually rolling in. Uh, well, somebody okay. says they don't see sales on the left. Okay, so you might have a, a different word there. You're going to see revenue or income. It's the same thing. But no sales. Is look on the left and let, look on the left and tell us what you see. It is invoicing. Ah, well, click on click on that. She's got one. It, let me tell you something. That's about this is so annoying when it comes to the online edition. They'll make changes but they roll it out slowly. So some of you may have it saying sales. Some of you may have it say something else. Because it used to say invoicing, and then they changed it. I'm surprised yours still does. Uh, you might be one of the ones that's in trouble. They have red flagged a few people uh, that uh, I think people that have been breaking the law. So you must be breaking the law, I think is what that is. I'm completely <laughs> kidding. Don't pay attention to me. All right, I'm going to move on. I'm sorry, but it's 2:30. We got an hour left, and I want to get in. I want to have 30 minutes for the income, and then 30 minutes for the rest of it because the income takes a while. So, here we go. Are y'all ready? Chat me up if you're ready. <laughs> I'm going to take a sip of water here. Mm. And I do have one more slide I want to show you. Are we having fun yet, people? Uh, go, 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 she says. All right. So when it comes to entering your income, we're going to talk about entering income. Now let me just tell you right up front, uh, what a lot of people do when they first get QuickBooks, if it's the online edition, the very first thing they do, and I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't do this, is they link their account so that the transactions automatically download. But when they download, they're not actually in QuickBooks yet. You have to add them into QuickBooks, all right? Or if they're already in QuickBooks, you match the download to what's already in QuickBooks. Okay? So uh, regardless of whether you have the download or not, you still have to figure out either how to manually enter the income or how to uh, add it into QuickBooks or match it into QuickBooks using the link from your bank. Okay? So there are actually two methods for uh, getting your income into QuickBooks. And let me get my little arrow here. There's the lump method and the individual method. Now the lump method means that you've decided that you don't care about entering individual donors, members, students. You're not using QuickBooks as a donor, member, or student database, so you want to just enter your income lumped by category. And what I mean by that is by income account. Okay. Uh, Whereas, if you do want to use QuickBooks as a member, uh, donor, or student database, then you're going to use the individual method. So right now, who has a lump? Uh, who does? Who has an outside of QuickBooks database? And if you do, just type what it is. I want to know who has an outside of QuickBooks database. I'm talking about 
uh, um, uh, donor tools or gift works or little green light or neon or uh, donor perfect. What do we got? Member Max, Salesforce, Apricot, gift works, Salesforce, Razor's Edge. Ooh, that's expensive. Power Church, way cool. That's something way cool. Oh, just Excel, Larry. I don't think so. <laughs> But anyway, so uh, Bloomerang. Oh, but we don't use it with QB. Yeah, with QB. Donor Snap. So let me just say this to you guys: If you have an outside of QuickBooks donor uh, member or student database, most of the time, if they say that they sync with QuickBooks, the sync doesn't work very well. So very few people use the sync. All right. So most people are just kind of manually entering the transactions that they've entered it in the other software package and they're entering it in QuickBooks. No sense in entering them individually. You want to use the lump method. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen again. And we'll show you what the lump method would look like. Now, if you download transactions, and I don't, I'm not going to teach you how to download because this is, I'm assuming you already know how to do that. It just happens automatically every day once you set it up. You just go down here and connect accounts. But I'll go to my bank account. By the way, isn't that, isn't that driving you crazy? Needs attention. Just ignore it. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm going to go to some downloaded transactions. They're not in QuickBooks. But the lump method is basically you would go to a, tra a downloaded transaction. Here's one. You would click it, and then you would click the Add, and then you just basically this this may be this 1500 may be made up of 15 different donations. Who cares? We're just lumping it. So we're going to lump it, and we put it to uh, whatever the income account is uh, that it relates to. Where is income? Oh, it's up at the top here. Okay, individual contributions. Uh, you'd want to point it to a class. So if this was related to an individual program, what you want to do is you want to point the income to the program. Unrestricted donations, you just put to the fundraising class. Okay? Uh, and no sense putting a name because it's a bunch of different people and we're not tracking it that way. And then you just click Add. That's the lump method. And by the way, if you do have a deposit that's broken into different income accounts, you can push this splits button here. And then it allows you to point some of it to the individual, whereas the rest of it maybe was a corporate grant, whatever. Okay? So that's what happens if you are going to download it. Now if you're not downloading, if you don't have your QuickBooks uh, synced, then to do the lump method, you're just going to go to the plus sign, and you're going to go to the bank deposit, and then you're just going to enter your income again lumped. So uh, individual contributions. Uh, we got – well, actually, we'll make this membership dues. We got four checks. Total was $425. Why is that – I keep pushing zero. 25. There we go. Uh, and it was for the Guidance Center, so we'll put it to that program. This is the lump method. All right? uh, and then you would enter the next one. Uh, let's say it was this deposit also included some individual contributions. Now the individual contributions, let's say they weren't restricted. Say they were for just unrestricted. They're not for a particular program. You can use them how you want to. What class should I point them to? Chat me up an answer. I want to know. I told you a minute ago. Which one would you choose if it's unrestricted? Doesn't go to a different program. To a specific. Yeah, you put it to fundraising. And just so that you can understand, uh, let me let me leave this. That's the that's the lump method. It's not very hard, but just so that you can understand uh, why that you do that, why you put unrestricted stuff to uh, the fundraising class, and that is so that you can truly see when you look at a P&L by class um, whether or not you made money. So like the Guidance Center had $120,000 of revenue. We spent $131,000. we have lost $11,000. So this, it's kind of like each program is its own little department or division, and you can see whether it's making or losing money. So if we put unrestricted stuff, and we know the unrestricted stuff was probably used for the Guidance Center, but 
we don't rather than putting it there, just put all the unrestricted stuff over in fundraising. Because you can take this to a funder and say, you know, the guidance center is doing really well. We're losing 11000 Can you just give us a $12,000 grant, and then we'll be good to go? Well, what they don't know is that you've got unrestricted donations that are covering it, but that will free up those donations to do other things with, like maybe give yourself a raise. So, um, but anyway, so uh, that is uh, why it's so important to do that. So that's the lump method. So I'm going to stop for a second and see if anybody has any questions about the lump method. Now, if you use the lump method, can't use QuickBooks as a donor database. So there's no sense in entering the transactions individually. But anyway, I'll stop for now. Who has questions about that before we move on to the second part of income? Um, that part's pretty simple. Well, uh, people are having like specific questions about like Square and Stripe and PayPal. Okay. So um, what? Give me, give me one for each. Give me a question. Read something in particular. Well, like how do I guess how they handle the the the, the square and the stripe? And the well, PayPal. okay. Well, I have to ask them. So, S Square and and PayPal. I don't know about Stripe. They'll download into QuickBooks. But if you have your bank downloading into QuickBooks and you have PayPal or um, Stripe downloading into QuickBooks, then a lot of times you'll get the thing. You'll get the same thing twice. So you'll have to kind of – what I do is I download from the bank, and then I look at my PayPal or Stripe report to figure out how to enter the transaction. So in other words, if I see a deposit in my bank feed, this one here, let's say it's from Stripe or, or from uh, – um, uh, uh, what was the other one? Stripe or Square. Uh, you'll know it because it will say it in the description field. And then you'll click here, and you'll have to split it, which means you're going to have to know how much of that deposit came from each place, how much of it was uh, related to membership dues versus how much of it was related to you know, whatever your other income accounts are. Okay. And then some people are like, well, wait a second. Um, the money that got deposited, they subtracted out my fee. And how do I handle that? Well, what you do is you click, you add another line here, and then in the category, you put – let me see if I have – no, I don't have one here, so I'm just going to put bank charges, bank service charges. And you enter that as a minus so that it equals the amount of money that was actually deposited in the account. So that's how you do it. It's a pain, but that's how you do it. You have to know um, how to split that stuff. Now, did that answer any questions, or did it just raise more questions? What do we got? Uh, I don't know. I've been stuck on the, the, the queue of questions, so I don't lose the ones that I have in queue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not reviewing the ones that are popping up now. Um, uh, which then I just lost it. So somebody said that they receive lump deposits from uh, GiftWorks weekly. So some donations end up in a different month. Is there a question related to that? Uh, I'm not sure. That was I thought maybe okay. you would understand what they were talking about. Um, All right. Uh, is there an easy way to track the method by which donations came in, for instance, from online compared to in person? Or check so yes, yes, there is. Um, uh, I mean, basically, if you don't want, remember, everything that we're doing now is if you don't want to use if you don't want to use QuickBooks as a donor database. If you do want to use QuickBooks as a donor database and you want to track all that stuff, I'm going to give you a different method. All right. Um, but this is only for those of you that have an outside of QuickBooks database. Uh, and you know, it's interesting, when you go to add something here, the only options that we have are we have the category and the class. And this is the type of income. This is what, uh, what program admin or fundraising. Now since you're lumping it, you could use the received from line and set up a fake person called Square, another one called PayPal, and you could do the received from here. 
if you wanted to do it that way, that might be a possibility to track that stuff separately. Um, let's take one more question, and then we're going to switch to the other method of entering your income, which allows you to actually use QuickBooks as a donor database. But what other question do we have here? Well, someone has their PayPal integrated with uh, QuickBooks, and they wanted to know mm -hmm. how to break the lines, and they could use the lump method. How, how to, to break, break PayPal? Oh, how to break yeah. the lump um, so that, to be honest with you, I, I don't know how that works. I think you have to go – Megan might know. I think it's probably in the apps here. Uh, if you click on the apps, I think PayPal will be listed. And I think uh, any, any app that you have connected will be here, and I think you, you, you stop the link from here. Um, but I don't know the specifics of how to do that. Here's my apps. Do I have any apps for this one? Yeah, so there will be an app in here, and you probably break, break the link from here in apps. I feel like I'm not really helping. Y'all chat up and tell me what's going on. Are y'all confused? Or do you feel, I was trying to give you just the lump method, and then I, we got into this, all this stuff about you know, the various payment methods, which I think is important. So I'll stop for a second more. How are we doing, David? Give me your judgment. Everyone's good. Really? Are y'all are okay? So All right. Okay, good. What about Elmore? I'm very worried about, about Elmore. Elmore, are you okay? Is Elmore all right? Elmore is not responding to you. Oh, okay. no. <laughs> I say they're doing fine. Are you, they're, they're just they're gone. They're done. <laughs> Let's keep all it right. going, Boston. All right. Now, here comes the meat. Now we're going to get into the fun part. This is how you enter income if you do want to use QuickBooks as a donor, member, or student database. Now, first of all, can you use QuickBooks as a donor, member, or student database? Certainly you can. Uh, what kinds of things can you get from them? Well, I'm going to click on Sales. You can go to a list of your donors right there. If you click on a donor, you'll get a window that basically gives you all the transactions for that donor, if you click on Transaction List, if you click on Donor Details, it gives you all the individual details on that donor, name, address, stuff like that. If you want to change something on them, you can just click the Edit menu, and it opens up the window where you fill in the name, the address, the phone number, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? So you certainly have a window when you're on the phone, much like you do with a CRM, where you can get good information about the donor. Uh, can you get a donor thank you letter? Well, you certainly can. Uh, when you are in the middle of entering a transaction, I'm going to show you the right way to enter a transaction. But let's just click on one of these transactions that we have here. Here's a transaction right here. Now, when you go to print this thing, let's see what it looks like. Um, uh, actually, I need to change to a different data file for this. Let me go to a different data file real quick here. Um, but the answer is yes, you can get a donor thank you receipt. Um, and I'm going to show you that in a second. Uh, let me make sure this opens here. So, and you know what I'll do? I'll just, you know, I'll go over here to where, the, where I was before, so I'm being consistent. See, in this data file it's called Customers, but I could have changed it to Donor too, and you already know how to do that now. I showed you. But we'll click on somebody, and I'll just click on an individual uh, transaction that you entered. And it's possible uh, when you go to print this thing, the way that QuickBooks prints these or emails them, initially it looks horrible. It looks like this. So you are saying, ah, I can't really get a thank you out of it. But you actually can um, because if you can customize it and create your own form, which is very actually easy to do. I have a whole uh, chapter on it in my training product. You can make it look like this. Uh, so that it says donation receipt, it gives you all the wording that you want, and it even says this down at the bottom. Now, it's not actually like a letter, um, but you actually can get a letter too, an actual letter, but it requires you to do something special, and I'll mention it in a second. Uh, I I'll mention it in a few minutes. So yes, you can get – now can you get a year-end report? You can certainly get year-end reports that you can give to your donors. Uh, let me go to a report here. First of all, I've already saved one here. It's called a Sales by Customer Summary Report. 
Basically what it does is it gives me a list of my donors, and I've set it up so it gives it to me by year. So I can very easily see how much my donors have given every year. And it's very quick, and very quickly you can determine, okay, it looks like Chad Marie Brown, they gave every year, but they didn't give this year. Maybe I need to call them. So this is a really wonderful report. I'm going to go ahead and uh, change the way this looks. Rather than having a by year, I'm just going to make it total only. So it will be a little bit easier to read. Uh, so here's a list of my donors. And I think I can sort it too. So I can sort it in ascending or descending order. I'll sort it in descending order. And then the donors that gave me the most are at the top, and then it goes down from there. So that's, that's pretty cool, I think. But anyway, if you want to use QuickBooks, and you can also email from it. I'm, I'm going to show you. But if the main thing I want you to understand is that if you are going to use QuickBooks as a donor, member, or student database, you have to use the sales forms when entering transactions. So let me just explain to you what I mean by that. I'm going to go to the dashboard. If you want to use QuickBooks as a donor, member, or student database, the wrong way to enter transactions is to either manually go to the bank deposit window and enter things, you would think this would be the right way of doing it because see, I can put the name of the person, I can put the income account, individual contributions. There's a lot of you do. This is a payment method. It's a check. Here's the check number. Here's the dollar amount. We'll make it a, we'll make it a million dollars. And it's unrestricted. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, we'll go to fundraising. So, and then you go on to the next line and enter the next donation. Some of you might be doing this now. You can't, your bank will be right, your financials will be right, but you won't be able to get a thank you letter, and it won't appear on any of the great reports that QuickBooks has. I'm going to go ahead and save this transaction. Uh, let's see here. I wish there was just a save. So I'm going to click Save and New. And then I'm going to go back over here to my little report. I'm going to refresh the screen and see whether or not that million dollars appears on the screen, and indeed it does not. And the reason why is because you didn't enter it correctly. You entered it in the Make Deposit window, which is the only – that you only go there, once again, you only go there if indeed you plan on uh, not using QuickBooks as a donor database. So this is the wrong way. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and delete this transaction. The right way is to use the sales forms. Now what are we talking about when we say the sales forms? These are forms that QuickBooks assumes that you're giving out to the donor. You don't have to give it out to the donor if you don't want to, but you have to use the form if you want to use QuickBooks as a donor database and get good reports. There are one of two forms that you'll be using. One of them is called the invoice form. The other one is called the sales receipt form. The invoice form you'll use if you want to invoice customers ahead of time. The sales receipt is what most of us will use because most of us don't do invoicing in QuickBooks, and it's just when the income comes in, we've got to have a figure out a way to enter it. So you're going to use a sales receipt form. So how many of you have never used a sales receipt form? I want you to type if you've never used a sales receipt form. Go ahead and type it. I want to hear. Who's never used one, David? Be proud. Don't be, don't be shy. I want to hear if you've never used this form before. Oh, there is a lot of people. <laughs> All right. Well, let me tell you something. Here, give me somebody's name. Uh, Gwendolyn. Who, who's it? Gwendolyn. Greg, Greg Boston here. How you doing, Gwendolyn? Gwendolyn, I'm about to change your life. All right? You've probably been doing the whole make deposit thing, or you've just been downloading them and then just pointing them to something. That's only okay if you're doing the lump entry. If you want to use QuickBooks as a database, and I know you might not like this, you're going to have to enter them individually in the sales receipt screen. Okay? So here's what you're going to do. Um, when you get money in, even before it goes into the bank, you pick the name of the person here. They pay me by check. It's the same information that appears on the Make Deposit window. Uh, they, let's see, they gave me an individual contribution, and they gave me a million dollars. 
and it went to fundraising. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and save that transaction. And now I'm going to back over to the report. I'm going to ref why? And it's still not showing here. Why is it not showing here? Somebody chat me up and tell me why it's not showing. Gwendolyn? It should show because this is the right way to enter it. Refresh your screen? Yeah. Every, it's annoying. In the online edition, uh, and I know a lot of you younger people are like, what's annoying about that? I'm cool with refreshing my screen. But those of us that are a bit older and that are used to using the desktop version, we don't have to refresh our screen every two seconds. But anyway, we'll click it. And look at that. Now we got a million dollars. Okay. Also, if we go to where their uh, customer is, I'll click Customer right there. Customers, and I'll go to Parker and Faith Ashford as soon as it pops up. And you'll see that million dollars will now be on their on their little their little setup screen or their home page or whatever. So we're queuing into theirs, and there's the million dollars right there. Okay? So um, that's the right way to do it. So you might be saying to yourself, well, Greg, I'm still a little upset because I've never used this before. And this seems like a lot of work because I'm used to entering the Make Deposit window, and the Make Deposit window is a lot simpler and a lot easier because with the Make Deposit window, I can just have different lines. You know? uh, well, first of all, the information is the same here as it is in the sales receipt. Name of the donor you put here, income account, Here's the reference number, that would be the check number, the payment method, the class, that's the program, and the amount. Okay? Name of the donor, income account, check number, payment method, class, and amount. <laughs> it rhymes. That's the same information you put here. So even though you may never have seen this, Gwendolyn, you already know how to do it. Name, let me, name of the donor, income account, check number, payment method, class, and amount. It's the same information. Now you may be saying, well, Greg, this is annoying because I've got to do a separate one of these for each person, whereas when it comes to the deposit, I can just do separate lines. So this will be quicker. No, it won't. When you get to the end of this line, you've got to either push the tab button or click the mouse to go to the next line. Over here, you just click Save and New, and then it goes to the next one. Okay? So it's the same number of clicks. I know I've counted. And again, the benefit of using this is now you can get a nice little thank you receipt from it um, that you can immediately – look at this – save and send. You can send it right to the donor. Boop. You can send it right to the donor. And then they get the little donation receipt. It's very cool immediately. It's all one-stop shopping, folks. Okay? Now there's a couple of things I've got to teach you. Then this, by the way, is the hardest part of learning how to use these forms. So listen very, very carefully. I'm actually going to take a little drink of water here. How many of you love LaCroix? I am so into LaCroix these days. It's like drinking a soft drink, but it's healthy, supposedly. I don't know. I actually prefer drinking ones without flavor more. Really? No, I'm a wine yeah. guy. Chat me up your favorite flavor of LaCroix, please. Oh, it's very important. <laughs> there's there's but quite a few of the LaCroix, LaCroix lovers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the younger people. I'm young. I'm only 26 years old. I'm lying through my teeth. All right. So, um, all right. The, there's a couple things. If you're going to use the sales form, now listen very carefully. You better stop what you're doing and listen to me right now. Otherwise, you'll be asking later, and I refuse to answer you. So here we go. When I told you to use the sales receipt form, there is another list. Oh my gosh, Elmore, we got another list that we have to set up if we're going to use the sales receipt form. And that is we have to set up a list called the product service list. You see here, this is where you put the name of the donor. That came from the customer or the donor list. That's pretty easy. Here's where you put the payment method and the reference number. That's pretty simple. You just type the dollar amount. The class, that came from the class list. Here I told you to put the income account, but that's not what you're putting here. Actually what you're putting is the product or service. 
So what in the heck is a product or service? Now let me just tell you, I could spend two hours teaching a webinar on product service list. It is actually a pretty cool list for you because we want to make this easy. This is QuickBooks Made Easy. The product service list, what is it? It is basically equal to your income accounts. Product service equals income account. I'll say it again. Product service equals income account. You see, you can't put an income account here. You have to put a product service that points to an income account. So if you're going to start using these forms, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to go to the product service list. Where do you go to get to the product service list? I'm testing you all now. Where do you think you'd go to get to it? Even if you've never known where it is before, you should be able to figure it out. Where do I put my mouse? Here. There you go. And then under lists, I don't even have to click all lists. There it is, products and services. Now what you want to do is you want to click new right here, and you want to create a product service item for each of your income accounts. So you're going to look at your chart of accounts list. You're going to look at the income accounts, and you're going to say, okay, here's an income account called individual contributions that I set up. Well, in order to use the form, I've got to create a product service item that points to that income account. How do you do it? Well, first thing you do is you pick the type. Now, if it is something that is a service, you pick service. Now, Elmore, you wanted to know how to sell products. You would also pick service for your products unless you want to use QuickBooks to track inventory. Then you track inventory. You click that. I'm going to click service. You put the name of it. You might say t-shirt here, but I'm going to say I'm doing it just for my individual contributions account. Individual contributions. Now I could actually call this any name I want. That doesn't link it to an income account. Here's where it's linked to the income account down here. You scroll until you find the income account that you wanted to be pointed to. There it is. So I just, to make it easy, I named my, ser my product service the same name as the income, ac uh, income, income account that it points to. And then you save it. I already have one in here, so I'm not going to save it. But as a result, what that means is they go, okay, whenever I see – let me see if I can find where I put that. Here it is. Uh, whenever I see – uh, somebody, what QuickBooks is going to say is whenever you use this service on a sales receipt, particularly this sales receipt, it's going to go, oh, okay, I know what you mean. You want to point it to this income account. Now you might say to yourself, Greg, this is really stupid because why can't I just put an income account here? Why do I have to go through this weird list called product service? Well, let me tell you why. The reason why is because, are you ready for this? QuickBooks was not meant for nonprofits. That's right. I said it. I don't work for Intuit, so I can say it. QuickBooks was not meant for nonprofit organizations. What I'm trying to tell you here is this is a sales receipt, guys. Forget about QuickBooks. When do you get a sales receipt in your life? Tell me, it's the weekend. When do you get a sales receipt in your life? What are you doing when you get a sales receipt? Where are you? Shopping. You're shopping. You're at a store. When you go to a store and you buy a bunch of stuff, you go up to the counter, you pay, and they give you a sales receipt, is the general ledger income account on Target's books sitting on your receipt? No. What's on your receipt? The products and services that you bought. Ah, uh ha. -huh. You see, they thought you were going to give this to people. Now, you don't have to give it to people, but we kind of have to create this product service and point it to an income account. Now, if you're a small nonprofit, you may just have one product service that points to the one income account you have, individual contributions. But you can use this product service list to get more granular in terms of the various types of income that you have. Notice how we have, look at this, under uh, member dues, we have four, yeah, it looks like we have four different product services. 
We have an affiliate member, a general member, and a sustaining member. So I'm going to edit this. When I set this affiliate member up, I pointed it to membership dues right there, and I gave it a price of $50. Whereas if I pick sustaining member, and I'll edit that one, we're pointing it to the same member dues income account. So you can have more than one product service item that points to the same income account. Target would have 10,000 of them that points to the same income account. But here, this is a sustaining member, and they get billed at 710 versus 50. So when you go to do a sales receipt, let me go over to the sales receipt here. I'm going to change this. I can pick an uh, affiliate member, and it pops up at $50 right there. And then I can also, but if I pick – what was the other one that I picked? I can't remember. Um, sustaining member, it pops up at 710. And the person, Elmore, who wanted products, you see how there's, it assumes that you're, you're selling one of this thing, even though it's a service. Yours would be a product. And then it has the rate. Look what happens here. If I say, eh, I'm selling 20 of these, I'm selling... 30 of these. Now, you'd never have one person that bought a bunch of them. But anyway, it just shows you how it's multiplying it out. You put it to whatever the program is that it relates to, you're good to go. Now, one of the benefits of using these product services, in addition to make it easier when you're, when you're entering, is you can get reports based on the product service list. So let me go over and show you uh, under reports. And I'm going to go to my sales reports. That's under all reports. So you go to all reports. And then when you're in all reports, you're going to see something that says review sales. You click it. It gives you the different types of sales reports. And you want to look, rather than a sales by customer report, which is what we were looking at before, you can look at a sales by product service report in detail or in summary. I'll do in summary. And what it's doing here is – I'm going to make the date range all dates. And what it's giving me here is a list of my income by product service item. So look at how I can get granular in terms of where I'm getting my income from. Here's my, my member dues. Now, not only do I see how much I'm getting from each member type, and remember, these are all pointed to the same membership dues income account. So without cluttering up the chart of accounts, I have this list where I get the details. But something else, it tracks quantities. It tracks the number of times the thing was used the number of members you have, the number of products that you sold, Elmore. This is wonderful. If you were using sub-accounts to track this stuff or in your chart, it wouldn't, wouldn't track the quantity. All you would get was the dollar amount. Look at how else I've used it. What if you have sponsorships for a, um, for a special fundraising event? You'd, you'd just have one income account called sponsorship fees, but then here you'd have multiple product services that are pointed to it. Isn't that kind of cool? Um, let me see what else we have here. <laughs> I'm going crazy with the arrow. Look at this. This is my personal favorite. Look at this. Fall direct mail campaigns, spring and summer. I use these so that when I enter donations, I pick on the sales receipt which one it is. And then this tells me they all go to the same income account, individual contributions. But now I can see not only how much I made, the, but the number of donations, and look at this, it divides the number of donations into the total dollar. It gives me the average donation. Now, how cool is that? So even if you, you're like, Greg, I don't need all this fancy smancy stuff. I'm real small. Fine. Just create one item or one product service item. But when you create it, you'll still be able to see what your average donation is. This one's 1,008. I hate the way they make the decimal go out. No, there's nothing we can do about that. But anyway, there's one more thing I've got to teach about this, and then we're going to stop and take some questions because I know I'm probably blowing, you, blowing your mind. <clears throat> so what I want you to do is the other question that I have to answer has to do with, well, what bank account is this thing going in, right? So what I need to do is I'm going to delete this transaction. 
Um, and we're going to actually do this like you're supposed to do it in real life. So if you want to use QuickBooks as a donor, member, or student database, you can't just depend on the download, guys. You've got to enter the transactions first. Okay? So you do it. You go over here to the plus sign, and we're going to do a sales receipt. And so say it's Tuesday, you got in a donation, you put the name of the person, it was Parker and Faith Ashford, they gave us a donation, it was, part, it was an individual, actually we'll make it part of the spring direct mail campaign, and they gave us a donation of $25. Okay, and it's unrestricted, so it goes to the Guidance Center. So you're good to go. Obviously you can go and print this and send it to the donor. I won't go into how to create the letter, but um, that's a little bit beyond what we have time for. But anyway, the other thing you've got to decide has to do, and I'm going to really zoom in on this. It has to do, did I just blow your mind? Um, it has to do with where you're going to deposit the money. You see this deposit to field? That tells you where you're going to deposit the money. Now, you're usually, well, you've got some choices here. You can deposit it to one of your bank accounts, or you're supposed to pick this weird account in QuickBooks called Undeposited Funds. Now, here's the deal. What a lot of people do is they're like, well, this $25, I'm going to end up depositing it into the bank someday, so you pick the bank account. <clears throat> That's wrong, okay? The only time you're supposed to pick the bank account is if you're going to the bank right then, the second you got the check, and you're taking it to the bank, and you have no other transactions that you're depositing with it. And then what it'll do is it records an increase in the bank account, uh, and basically your bank account goes up and it records an individual deposit. But that's not what we do. We don't deposit it immediately. So what do we do? Forget about QuickBooks for a second. You come back from the mailbox or the mailman drops by as a check for $25. You're holding it in your hand. What we want you to do is enter into QuickBooks, not later, but immediately. So QuickBooks knows you got the check. But what are you going to do with that check? Where are you going to stick it? It's too small to go to the bank. Where are you going to put it? Not in QuickBooks, in real life. Where do you put it? Chat me up an answer. Anybody know? Uh, cash box, safe, deposit yep. bag, lock cabinet, uh, perfect, door. perfect. Exactly. And if that's what you're doing, what would you say? What's the last thing you said, David? Wallet. Wallet. I put it in her wallet. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I want to hire her or him. All right, so um, we're going to click Undeposited Funds. Now, Undeposited Funds is an account that you all already have. I'm telling you, you've got it. And it's in your chart of accounts list. I'm going to go to the chart of accounts list. And what this is, this is basically an account in QuickBooks that is the representation of the money sitting in your drawer, in your wallet, in the safe, in the box, waiting to be deposited. You don't want to put it in the bank account. You had not gone to the bank yet. So you're supposed to put it here. So actually, a lot of people change the name of this account, Undeposited Funds, and they'll change it to that money in my, I'm going to say wallet. <laughs> that's hilarious. All right. So that's what it's supposed to be. Okay? So watch how this works. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to pick, well, it probably changed the name now. There we go. So, uh, and let me just go back over here. So you see right now that money in my wallet is at zero. The checking account's at 183000 I'm going to click Save. I'm going to go back over to the chart of accounts. I've got to refresh it. Again, that money in my wallet is at zero. I refresh the window, and now that money in my wallet is at $25, and the bank account hasn't changed. Good. shouldn't change. I haven't gone to the bank yet. Let's do another one in case you missed it. Okay? Let me do a new one. Save a new. Uh, we're going to go over here to, let's see, David Bowie. Uh, this person paid us with cash. Uh, and let's see, we're going to put this, let's say this was the fall direct mail campaign. Uh, I dropped by the office, gave me $100 in cash. 
pointed fundraising. And again, we don't put it to the bank account. We put it here. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to refresh. And now that money in the drawer, it used to be 25. Now it's 125. Okay. Let's do one more because I know a lot of you get money online or through credit cards and stuff like that. So if you want to use QuickBooks as a, uh, as a donor database, got to enter that stuff. So I'm going to go in here and uh, Matthew Bove, they paid with a credit card. Uh, you can add a new one here yourself. Uh, so I wonder if I can just add something called Stripe. I probably can. Yeah, I can add Stripe right here. Uh, so that was Stripe. And now, you don't actually put anything in the drawer, but I tell you one thing, it's not going in the bank account yet. There's a delay, and it probably is going to be batched with other transactions. So you put it to the drawer anyway, and then we'll say this was a gold sponsor. It was $500, and we'll go ahead, and that was for, let's see, fundraising and save. We'll go back over here. And we'll click Refresh. And so what it does is it's basically accumulating all the money that you've entered but haven't gone to the bank with, bank yet. Okay? Uh, so that's why that person who enters the deposits a while ago, David, who was saying it's just deposited once a week and some of the deposits are in the prior month, well, if you enter them individually, then they're in the right date. Okay, and it accumulates here. So then what happens at the end of the week when it's time to go to the bank, in, in real life you open up your wallet or the drawer or the box and you take all the checks and cash out of it. In QuickBooks, you click Bank Deposit. And the deposit window opens up, but unlike those of you that have an outside of QuickBooks database, all your individual stuff is sitting right here. And so basically everything that's here should be in your hand because you've taken it out of the drawer. If there's something on this list that's not a credit card anyway, and it's not in your hand, somebody stole something out of your wallet, girl. Okay? And so that is called a internal control, okay? and that's good. So we like that as accountants. So um, I'm going to go ahead and check the cash. And I must have not said that this was a check, so I need to go ahead and put that in here, put the check number. It's interesting. You can do it after the fact. Uh, and I'll check that off. And so I'm depositing the 25 and 100. So I'm going to go back to the uh, – I'm going to let me just go ahead and save this thing, save it. And then I'm going to look at my chart of accounts here. And let's see, that money in the drawer is at 525 right now. The checking account is at 183. Everybody see this? 183, 525. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to refresh it. Uh, oh, it looks like it had already deposited it. Darn it. So um, I guess that number, it should have gone down. That's unfortunate. I think I did that wrong. Well, let me do it again. So um, there's money in the drawer here. So let me go and do that one more time. I'm going to go to Missed the check platform. Check on Ashford check. Missed check on Ashford check. Right. I missed it because that was the credit card. So the credit card will have to deposit on its own, and you don't know how that was deposited unless you go to the bank. So you go to the or you go online and you say, okay, oh, I see what you mean. I forgot to to check um, this one. Yeah. But anyway, we'll do the uh, – I'm glad you all caught it. So here's the credit card one, Matthew Bove. So uh, I'm going to check that off. And then let's say they deducted their fee. Some people don't. Some people do. Uh, and so let's see. I created an account here called Credit Card Merchant Fee. I enter the dollar amount as a minus $12.58. And we'll point it to fundraising. Uh, actually, no, this would always go to admin. The fee should always go to admin. So now, let me just go back over here. This is at 525. I'm going to go ahead and save and close. I'm going to go back over to the chart of accounts. I'm going to refresh it. It's at 525 now. I'm going to go ahead and refresh it. And now it's only at 25. 
And that was that last one. So that's basically it. We actually only have 15 minutes left to go through the expenses stuff. But this was actually the hardest part of the webinar. So let me stop for a second, and we'll take some questions. And we're probably going to go over probably about 10 minutes on this. Um, but I do want to make sure everybody's happy. So I'm more interested in making you all happy than, than ending exactly on time. I want to make, if that's okay with you, Seema. But uh, David, go ahead and, and ask me some questions here. What do we got? We have a lot of questions. So I would say we probably should only ask a few, and then we could continue to answer them on the back end since we're limited. Um, all right. Uh, how do you enter reimbursement income for an expense? How do you link reimbursement to expense? Uh, oh, in other words, when you enter an expense is, and it's going to be reimbursed by a grant, I think uh -huh. is what that person's saying. So yeah. that is going to take a minute, and I'll teach you when I get to the expenses. What's the next question? How does that work when your bank deposit gets downloaded and you split it? So when your bank deposit gets downloaded, if you've already entered it, let me go to where the split is. What happens is when you download the transactions, theoretically you've already entered that information. All right? So if the deposit's already been entered, then you click on here and you click Find Match. And then you look for a deposit that matches that number. Now, but what some people do is they'll enter the sales receipt, they'll point it to undeposited funds, and then they don't even enter the deposit. When the deposit gets downloaded, they go into this screen, and let me show you how I get there again. I just click on it from the download, and I click Find Match, and it will give me all of the sales receipts that I've entered. And I can say, that deposit's made up of this one, and made up of this one, and made up of this one. I got $15 left, and maybe, uh, let's see, um, maybe that was something that I forgot to enter. So I can click Resolve Difference here, and it will let me add a new transaction. But it is only when it, let, when it lets me add a new transaction, it's only going to let me enter like a deposit. See, it's not going to let me enter uh, a new sales receipt. So that's why we want to enter the sales receipt. And then when you're done, and I'll just point this somewhere and click Save, and then it removes it from the download. So in other words, you could either uh, enter a sales receipt and then just download the deposit and link it to the sales receipts, or you could enter a sales receipt manually enter the deposit, and then uh, match the uh, download to the deposit, either one. Uh, and let's do one more question here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, so all donations must be manually entered even if you sync with your bank? Awesome. That is correct. Because if you think about it, if you want to use QuickBooks as a donor or a database, you know, you don't even have to ask me. Do you honestly think that Wells Fargo is going to go through each one of your deposits and enter them separately or download them? No, you're just going to get one lump number. A lot of people on the call, you already know this. And so if you're like in here and you're clicking each name individually, you must want to use QuickBooks as a donor database, and you can't. You need to do the sales receipt thing. So um, now I'm going to share my screen here. Well, actually, you know what? I think, what I'm, I, think I can do expenses really quickly, David. So let me do the expenses real quick. Well, so when it comes to the – A couple other – I know, I know. But I'm going to do the expenses. I want to do the last polls, and then, but I just want to get through the basics. Expenses are really easy. Okay? So there's a couple of different ways to enter expenses. What some people do is they'll enter a bill – and then later on, they pay the bill. So who does that? Chat me up if you enter a bill and then you pay the bill. I'm going to go ahead and click Bills. So this is what you would do if you aren't just relying on downloading, but you really want to use QuickBooks to track your payables. Who's doing that now? And I'm just going to enter there's a bill a here. Yeah, there's a, good. I'm glad. Because if you enter a bill, you can use QuickBooks as a database. So I'm going to enter a bill to um, the Dallas Convention Center, 
and I'm going to make it, uh, let's see, this was for space rental. Uh, do I have that in here? I don't know if I do. No. So I'll just put it to rent. And then we'll say this was for the Synergy Conference, and the amount of the, the bill was, we'll say, $20,000. Okay? So this date right here, this is supposed to be this bill date. This is really important. This date is the date the product or service was received. So when you look at a P&L, um, whatever date you put here, if you look at an accrual-based P&L, that's when the expense is going to appear. So if I put March here, it will appear in March. If I put April, it will appear in April. So you control what month the expense is by putting it here. Mostly the date on the bill is what you put here, but what you really want to do is you want to put the date the product or service really happened so that when you look at a P&L accrual base, you really see the activity for the year. All right? And so then after you enter the bill, I'll go ahead and save it. Then, oh, by the way, there's an attachment option here down here at the bottom left where you can actually attach, if you want to, the copy of the bill. Um, so that's really kind of cool. Um, but anyway, when you're ready to pay bills, you go over here and you click Pay Bills. So when you click Pay Bills, it will list all of your bills. And you simply check off which ones you want to pay. It's pretty simple. Okay. And then when you, you're done, now you could tell it that you want to either handwrite, which means you're basically telling it what the check numbers are. It means you're handwriting the checks, and they assume you have the checkbook there, and you're starting with check 1007, and then it's going to assume that you, this check for 20,000 is 1007, and this is 1008. But most people print their checks, so you just click print later right there. So then when you're done, you click save. And then the checks are entered, and they're waiting to print. So when you go to your, let me see here, print checks right down there. We click it, and it will give you a list of the checks waiting to print. And you, you order these checks, and you can order them from Intuit, or you can order them somewhere else. You make sure that's the right check number in the printer. You click Review and Print, and then you print your checks. It's kind of giving you a picture of each one of the checks. Okay? So that's if you pay by check. But I know a lot of you don't pay by check. Uh, you're like, you know what, I just download the transactions. I'm not going to do this inner bills and pay bills thing. So if you don't want to do the inner bills and pay bills thing, the only downside is you can't get an accrual-based P&L. Um, but you can just download the transactions. You just once again go into your download here. But the thing that I want you to understand is when you enter these transactions that have been downloaded, okay, you see if they're a check that you wrote, if you haven't entered it, you're going to have to be looking at the check to figure out what it is. The stuff that's paid by like a debit card or something, um, that will be here on the download. Uh, and the thing that I guess I want to make sure that you understand – at all of this, <laughs> Lester's – is that when you enter this, you want to make sure that you point it to a class. So the class feature doesn't show – I don't think it shows anyway. Yeah, it doesn't show on the main screen, at least not here. So what you've got to do is to enter these things, basically you click them, and you point them to whatever the expense account is, and it's very important, again, that you point them to a class, and then you click Add, and it removes it from the download. So if it's a debit card transaction, that's how I would probably do it. Now, if you're not downloading your transactions, then you'll be not downloading anything. So you would do the inner bills, pay bills thing usually. But sometimes somebody comes to you and they want to check immediately. They're like, you know, so maybe the copier person who repairs the copier came, your copier broke, you need it fixed. When they're done, they are not interested in you paying them later. They want money now. So in that case, you just go to the check screen, and you could just write a check right in the screen here. See, the only time you really go directly into the check screen is if there's no bill ahead of time. You're just writing a check because you're paying for it the moment you found out about it. 
Now, if you're going to manually enter transactions and you use a debit card, there is a tab just for you. If you go to the plus sign, there's something that says expense right here. You click it, and this is where you enter your debit card transactions if you're not downloading. At the name of the person. Once again, the main takeaway is every time you enter either a check or a debit card, whether you've downloaded it or entered it manually, doesn't matter. You just kind of make sure you point it to an expense account and you got to point it to a class. All right? So um, we only have four minutes left, David. We ran really long. I'm not sure why. Hey, hey Greg, this is Seema. I just wanted to, sure. um, I know a lot of people have to drop off at 1230. So um, before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to um, give them a little bit of information before we go. Sure. Let me, let, me, let me go back over here. Um, and there is one thing that's probably really important, uh, two things hey, actually. Guys, we're we're going we're to keep finishing, so if you want to know the information, just stay online, and we'll, we're going to keep teaching, and then we'll answer a few questions as well. Yeah. Okay. So Robin, I'll show you in a second. All right, so as you can tell, there's a lot to learn with QuickBooks. But if you feel like I'm somebody that you can deal with <laughs> talking to um, and getting your questions answered, I would encourage you uh, to either, get, either sign up for the three-day webinar series, and we'll be able to go a lot slower there and more methodically, and we'll have more time for questions, it's $200 normally. We're going to give it to you for $149, and you get that from the um, you get that from the uh, website QuickBooks Made Easy. So you go to QuickBooksMadeEasy.com, and then you use this code right here TSW50. It'll give you $50 off, and these are the dates of the webinar. If you would rather just talk to one of us at QuickBooks Made Easy, you can get a year, and I know this sounds too good to be true, but you can get a year of tech support for $149, okay? and that's normally $300. So you're getting half off for that. It's only good for 48 hours. You can call us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We can even dial into your software. Now, one of our training products, QuickBooks Made Easy, is available at TechSoup. So you can go to TechSoup and get that for $109. And that goes through in much more detail the essentials of learning how to use QuickBooks if you're a nonprofit. All right? So let me turn it over, and we'll give you these codes, but just remember these, this sale only lasts 48 hours. It ends on Saturday. So uh, don't go anywhere though because we're going to do the in-kind contributions and the grants, and we're going to answer questions too. Uh, but Seema, what else do you want to show on this slide so that the people that want to leave can do so? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I know a bunch of you have to jump off at 12.30, so before you go, um, I just wanted to let you know we have a post-event survey, and any feedback that you have on today's presentation is always really helpful to us. So if you could take the few extra minutes to fill that out, um, we would definitely appreciate that. You'll see it when you leave the webinar, and then also when you get the post-event email. Um, if you're on social media, give us a follow. We post a lot of tips and tricks on there as well. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we also have a blog where we post articles several times a week. And we have a few webinars that are coming up um, towards the end of the month, which you can see here. One is around cloud identity. Um, and then we have another one, uh, digital fundraising tools and trends in 2018. Um, so please uh, feel free to join us for those. And if you do have extra time, uh, Greg is going to go over your questions. And I think he has one more section left. So thank you for joining us. All right, cool. So let's, uh, let's do one thing. I want, I want to see who's left here. So um, uh, actually, where is that other poll? I want to do that other poll. Here we go. So everybody that's still here, we've got 300 people on the line. Uh, I want everybody to answer this. This is just not related to QuickBooks, so it will give us a break for a second. And then we'll, we'll take about 10 more minutes and we'll finish up. So which statement is false. I want everybody to answer which statement is false. If you dial 113 in South Korea, uh, that's what you do to report spies. Uh, the second one is Fruit Loops all have the same flavor. Uh, the third one is Bullfrog sleep 14 hours a day. See, you learn a lot in this, in this webinar. Uh, fifth one is New Bacteria are, have been discovered in hairspray. 
the body has 60, uh, six, 600, what is that, 60K miles? I guess that's 6 million. 60,000. 60,000 miles of blood vessels. <laughs> and a group of pandas is called an embarrassment. Which one of these is false? The other five are true, shockingly. So I want everybody to answer. We've got 293 people on the call. We've got 100 people that have answered. Now, you w wanted to stay late, so let's, <laughs> let's answer the question here. You well, know what? I'm just going to skip to the result. Yeah, you skipped to okay. the result. Okay. So Fruit Loops all have the same flavor. They think that's false. And group pandas are calling embarrassment. Those are both true. That's what you call a group of pandas and embarrassment, and Fruit Loops actually all have the same flavor. So the thing that's false is the one that, uh, that the least of you picked. Bull, bullfrogs sleep 14 hours a day. Bullfrogs never sleep. They look like they're always asleep, but they never sleep. How shocking is that? All right, so let's do some questions on the expenses, and then I'm going to cover the last two topics real quick. So this will just take about maybe 10 minutes. So uh, ask me questions about it, David. I know we probably have a lot. Well, um, I had people that wondered if the payments come out automatically, um, would they still write a check for it? Do the pay bill write a check? Ah, if you enter a bill and the payment comes out automatically, um, when you download transactions, I think that you can connect them to your bills, just like you can connect a deposit to individual sales receipts. So I'm going to go to my uh, download transactions, and when you click something here and you click Find Match, it's going to show you transactions, and I think it will show you your bills as well. I just don't know that I have any bills in this. Uh, here we go. There's a bill payment. Here's a check. Um, let me do 20 and see if I've got any bills in here. Um, there we go. So uh, it doesn't look like it lets me match it to a bill. I thought it did. So it looks like, and I, I, it looks like you can't match it to a bill. So in that case, if it's paid automatically, you will need to go to the pay bill screen. Um, and obviously, if you're not downloading, you'll need to go to the pay bill screen. So what's the next question? I would say we should move on, and then we can could, we could finish the questions after the fact. Some okay. Better. So um, a big thing that you want to know about, and I'm going to be honest with you, I could spend two hours talking about how to track restricted grants. So obviously we don't have time to do that. I'd only plan to spend about 10 minutes on it. Um, but we do have – don't we have a webinar coming up on tracking restricted grants, David? I think we do. Um, it's, with, it's going to be with GrantStation in December. Okay. All right. So anyway, so when you enter a transaction, we need a way of pointing a transaction to a grant. So basically, the thing you want to know about when it comes to a restricted grant, at the end of the, re of the funding period, you want to know how the dollars were spent. So when you talk about tracking restricted grants, what we're really talking about is how to designate an expense as being paid for out of a grant. Well, if you look at a check screen, and it would be the same as a bill screen, you see there's a place to put an expense account, and there's a place to put your program. Here's a place right here. See donor or customer? This is one place to go to to point an expense to a grant. So what you do if you want to track restricted grants in QuickBooks, if you have two options, one option is to use the customer or donor field. You put each one of your grants in the customer field. And if you notice here, I'm using the customer list. I've got a customer called Restricted Grants, and then I have sub-customers underneath it for each grant. The other thing I want you to notice is that if you have a funder who's giving you money, but it goes, but they give you the same grant every single year, you want to have a separate sub-customer for each one of your grants. 
from that funder. Because sometimes the very last transaction that was paid for out of the 2019 grant wasn't paid for until 2020. So this way you can pick which grant it is when you're entering the transaction. So very much like you can get a P&L by class, you can also get a P&L by grant. So what you do is, uh, we'll go over to reports and I'll show you where you go to do this. Um, you see how there's a P&L by class right here? There's also, let me get a different color here. Um, where was that red? There it is. Uh, P&L by donor. So when you do that, and I'll go ahead and run it, well actually I've already got one memorized. And I renamed it P&L by grant. You get a P&L for each one of your grants so that you can see not only what you got in, but which expenses were pointed to a grant so that you have a net down here at the bottom. Um, now, I don't have time, and it's beyond the scope of this webinar, um, but you can even do a budget for a grant. So I can enter, I can look at a report that will give me a budget to actual for a particular grant. It tells me the actual, it tells me the budget, and it tells me the variance. And I've used the customer job field for that. Okay? So that's one option for tracking your grants. Now the problem with that is if you download your transactions, which I know a lot of you do, and you download your expenses, you just go here, when you go to point an expense, uh, well, here's where you can point it to a grant. So you can point it to a grant right here, and you can point it to a program right here. But the problem is if you want to split a transaction where some of it's paid for out of a grant and some of it isn't, you can't do that with downloaded transactions. You can only split by class you can't, and account. You can't split by customer. In other words, you can only point one customer, or sorry, one transaction to one grant. So uh, if that's your problem, you either need to not download the transactions because you can enter them separately in the manual situation, or if you want to download transactions, then there's an alternative place that you can use to track your grants. So let me go ahead and show you where that is. I feel horrible that we're not able to get into more details here, but an hour and a half is just not long enough. That's why we have the other ways that you can learn. But uh, what I've done in this particular data file is I'm using the class list. So what I've done here is, yes, I'm using the class list for our program. See, we have one here for housing program. But then I have subclasses for each grant that relates to a program. So then what happens is when I'm entering a transaction in this second method, you leave this blank and over here you're basically telling it by picking the grant, you're telling it what grant it is and what program it relates to. Of course, sometimes you'll have expenses for a program that aren't paid for out of a grant, so you'll put it to a subclass called unfunded. But then you'll be able to get a P&L for your grant just by looking at a P&L by class. So it gives me a P&L for each grant, and then it gives me the total for the housing program. So that's the alternative method. So I've still got to teach the in-kind contributions. So um, uh, who has say, questions say, about the grant thing? We do, but I would say just keep teaching, and then we can answer a few questions because we're, okay. we're really running we'll out do. of time. Okay. Yeah, so I think we should probably wrap up in the next five, five minutes or so. Okay. So with the in-kind contributions, and again, I apologize for running long here. With the in-kind contributions, um, what this is, this is when someone is, is giving you something other than money. It's either going to be goods or it's going to be services. Now, um, since there's no money that changed hands, people often wonder how to get that stuff into the books. So the transaction is entered by using a journal entry.
Now I know most of you don't like journal entries. You probably don't know very much about them. But to do a journal entry, you go to the plus sign, and you click Journal Entry. Now you'll need to create one income account for your um, – let me get the right date here. Whoops. All right. Uh, you'll need to create an income account in your chart of accounts list called in-kind contributions. So just create one of those. You don't need multiples. And then to make an income account go up, you credit it. You put the fair market value of the thing that you're getting here. And then the other side of it is going to go to whatever expense account you would have pointed it to had you written a check for it. All right? So some people don't like that. Some people create an expense account called in-kind expenses, and we'll get to that in a second. But technically what you're supposed to do is point it to whatever the expense account is you would have pointed it to had you written a check. So I'm going to go to uh, – let's see. I think I have one here for counselors. There it is. And I'm going to point it there. You're going to point it to a class, Counseling Center. And that's how you enter an in-kind contribution. The person who you gave it to, you put here in the name field. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, save and close this. And I want to show you what this looks like on a report. So I'm going to go to a budget to actual report, which is what you would usually show your board. And I want to show you what happened here. So there's your income, and here's your expense. Okay, so it doesn't really change your total books, but it does more accurately reflect the true revenue you got because just because somebody gave you a product or a service doesn't mean it's not valued. It's a donation. So you'd be up here with income. But then also it more accurately reflects the true cost of running the organization. Okay? So um, it's very important that you have it. Now notice how this looks when you compare it to a budget. So under the budget, there's no budget for in-kind income. Well, your board's not going to be upset about that. That's fine. They didn't expect it. But if you pointed it, which is what I just told you to do, if you pointed to the same expense account that you would have had you written a check, and you didn't budget to include in-kind, then it's going to look like you overspent. So what some people do is instead of pointing it to the expense account, they create an in-kind expense account, and they point it there. Then we as accountants know that's wrong, and we have to move it up to the regular expense at the end of the year. So what I would say is instead of doing that, just wait to book your in-kind till the end of the year so you won't bother the board. If you have a lot of in-kind, then you should probably uh, you should probably um, budget to include your in-kind so that it would include the amount so it doesn't look like you overspent. So if you're like, say, a food bank, they, I mean, they can't survive without their, um, with their in-kind contributions. They're really important to them. So um, let's take a couple more questions here, and then we'll say goodbye. So who's got some questions about anything at all that we uh, have covered? Actually, Hi, this is Dima. Um, Sorry, I think I think we need to actually end it because we're about 15 minutes over. So, okay. Um, yeah, just so everyone okay. knows, we're going to be posting the um, presentation to the TechSoup website. So if you guys need to rewatch anything, um, all the information will be there. And then also, um, if you want to find out more about uh, what TechSoup offers, uh, here is a link that you can go to for more um, information. And uh, thanks again, Greg, for presenting today. A lot of people seem really happy with all the information that you provided. Um, okay. And, and I apologize that I ran over. I'm really sorry. Oh, Justin's all the way in the UK. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, uh, Susan, you can learn about budgeting in the online thing. Um, and the thank you letter takes about 20 minutes to teach. And so that you can you, we can do the three-day webinar. It will be there also. Uh, awesome. All right. Thank you everyone for joining, and uh, we'll be sending out a follow-up email. And thank you to our uh, webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk, and we hope to see you on the next one.